Today, we will be interviewing with Professor Matthew Louisier. Professor Louisier is an Associate Professor of Computational Nanoelectronics at ETH Zurich, Switzerland since 2016. He graduated in Electrical Engineering in 2003 and received his PhD in 2007, both from ETH Zurich. After a one-year postdoc at the same institution, he joined the Network for Computational Nanotechnology at Purdue in 2008 as a research assistant professor. He then returned to ETH Zurich as an assistant professor in 2011. His current research interests focus on the modeling of nanoscale devices such as multi-gate nanowires, 3-4 MOSFETs, band-to-band tunneling transistors, 2D semiconductors, memory resistors, and lithium-ion batteries. He won the ACM Gordon Bell Prize for High Performance Computing in 2019. He's also received a starting grant from the European Research Council in 2013. Allow me to introduce you uh, to Professor Matthew Louisier, Associate Professor, and our very own Swati, ECE Master Student in 2020-2021, and Zach Treasure. And I will pass this on to you, Swati. Thank you, Mauricio. Okay, so first of all, uh, let me uh, thank you for, for inviting me to, to participate uh, to that seminar. So I'm kind of honored to be there after a lot of uh, famous people, famous professor from, from Purdue University. So I have been there uh, many, many years uh, ago. So I left 10 years ago, but I still have very good memories of, uh, of Purdue. And that's also the reason what, why I accepted uh, that, uh, that invitation. Okay, what got you interested in science? And what is one of your earliest memories relating to science? Now, going back to my earliest memory of, of science, so that honestly, <laughs> I, so you say, you send me that question, I try to think about that, but I could not find uh, what was what was the beginning. So what I remember is why I decided to, to study electrical engineering, so that I, I remember, but uh, my er, um, earliest uh, remember, uh, souvenir of uh, science so that is a little bit too complicated but so okay. then i will focus on the second part of the question so it's um it goes back when i was uh, at high school so at that time i was kind of hesitating between uh, studying physics or studying uh, mechanical engineering and also electrical engineering and during the summer so i used to, uh, to do a little bit of uh, of work to earn a little bit of money and also because it was fun to do something different uh, during a, a short period of time like uh, five weeks uh, during each summer and I used to work for uh, for an electrical company uh, close to uh, to my home. So basically, they were the electricity provider to the homes all around. So I was working with a, a guy who was really close to retirement. He was about 60 years old. And we were going around and we were repress, uh, replacing cables uh, or we were uh, fixing cables or like uh, taking care of the public light uh, system and that kind of things. And that's... Uh, I mean, it was at first it was coincidence that I ended up there, but uh, with time, so I started enjoying that. And at one point, when I had to decide, I said, "Yeah, so I think it's uh, it's very interesting. So electricity, it's uh, it's fascinating. So I should uh, I should at least try to to learn. Uh, I should try to to study that and see where that that brings me." But my motivation at the beginning, that was uh, like a uh, high voltage. So that's why I came to electricity. So I really liked the fact uh, that you could produce electricity, that you could transport electricity. And I was more into looking for new energy sources. And even so, my main motivation back then, that was that, uh, so we have a lot of lightnings around. And I thought, yeah, that would be really cool if we could uh, capture that uh, that energy and we could use it, so plug in into, uh, into the network. So it turns out that, uh, in fact, uh, it's not that uh, viable as a solution, but at least it was a very nice uh, motivation at the beginning. Uh, uh -huh. But over time, so I, I went from uh, thousands of voltage, which was my motivation to kind of a micro, micro amper and, uh, and millivolt. So that completely shifted, but that was the beginning of the story. <laughs> Okay, so when you were first starting to play with electricity, did you imagine that that would take you on the trajectory that you are today, being in academia and being a professor? No, so I, I don't think so. so it was just, uh, as I said, so I, at first it was uh, like uh, like fun to, to work with that, but it was also, uh, I was really interested to understand so how everything works, because uh, when you have uh, just uh, any device you want, you just plug in and that works. But 
where was that electricity coming so uh, how was everything happening like why did we have three phases and that was 380 volt while when you plug in it's just uh, 220 volts so understanding yeah. that so that was uh, really something uh, that attracted me of course so when I, I went then to high school so I started understanding that uh, and I really wanted to continue along that road uh, and see uh, yeah, and, and become an expert in that uh, field. So it took me a lot of years, and uh, but now I think uh, it's good. But uh, as as you said, so it was not. Uh, I could not imagine that uh, at the beginning. So uh, what I wanted to do is uh, to do something that I liked and where I could have pleasure uh, to go to go to work. But I was not really imagining uh, iman imagining that I would be a, a faculty at one point. Yeah, makes sense. So when did you decide to uh, go to ET and Zurich and pursue your bachelor's and later your PhD degrees? So if you look, so in, in Switzerland, choices are limited. So I had two choices. <laughs> I, I could go to Lausanne, okay. to EPFL, which is the sister EPFL. school of, of ETH, mm -hmm. or I could go to Zurich. And uh, uh, so I'm a native uh, French speaking uh, person, as my, uh, my accent uh, says. Uh, so going to Lausanne, that would have been the, the easy choice. So I mean, uh, uh, easy. So it's not easy to go to, uh, to an engineer school and to get out with a degree, but it was easier to go that and to, uh, to do that in my mother language. While going to Zurich, that was more like a challenge because you had the language, it was in German, plus you had to, uh, to study um, everything. And on top of that, so I thought that I would do my, my career in Switzerland and German, it's the language number one. So if I wanted to have an, attracted, uh, an attractive uh, position in the future, I thought that uh, being able to be bilingual, that would be really uh, useful. So that's why I decided to, uh, to go there. So okay. then uh, you could also argue, yeah, maybe one school was, uh, was better than the other or something like that, but it never came into, uh, into my decision. So back then, I was not looking at uh, whether EPFL or ETH would be the best school. It was just like, uh, for me, what could bring me one school or the, uh, the other school? And in that case, that was both could uh, I could have become an engineer in both schools, but in one of them, I could also improve uh, my German. So that was the okay. motivation. So language also played a role in you choosing the school. Yes, exactly. So that was uh, the factor that uh, determined why I decided to go to Zurich. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I must ad admit that I partly fail, uh, fail on that <laughs> on that side, <laughs> since uh, what I didn't realize is that, uh, okay, it's, uh, it was still uh, difficult and it was challenging. Uh, and you, you had a small group of French speaking people and we tend to stay together. And what do you do when you stay together? So you speak your own language. And so I, I guess during the first years, my German did not really improve on the contrary. So I guess as compared to the high school level, it went back a little bit. But then uh, starting from the third year, so you have to mix up more, you have to work in small projects with other people. So I was kind of forced to, uh, to speak the other language. So when you moved to the US, which is a primarily English speaking country, did you have language issues? So no, we, we learn uh, we learn English at school, like uh, I guess uh, almost everywhere uh, in, the, in the world, yeah. of course. Uh, so <laughs> at the beginning, maybe uh, sometimes uh, I uh, had more difficulties than, than today to speak. So I had to look for, for the vocabulary. I like, uh, had to look for the words and certainly my pronunciation was uh, worse than, than it is today. Uh, so then, but I guess uh, people, they are very nice and very kind in the sense that uh, they always try to understand uh, you or they will uh, ask you to repeat. While the experience was a little bit difficult, uh, different when I was in Zurich. So when I was trying to speak uh, German and if I was making a mistake, so people will, uh, would try to reply to me in French because they had learned <laughs> French at school, which was kind of offending for me because I was really making the effort <laughs> and people were replying to yeah. me in my, in my own language. So that never happened in, in the US. <laughs> so that's the nice uh, thing. Uh, on the contrary, people were telling me, oh, you have an accent, but where do you come from? While for me, it was obvious that with my accent, I, sh I should come from, uh, from a French speaking country. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So uh, what motivated you to come to the US and what motivated you to choose Purdue? Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, so after my PhD, so I was kind of uh, interested to stay in, uh, in academia. And then, uh, so if you want to stay in academia and if you are in Europe, so 
going to the to the US, it's almost something that you must uh, you must do. So you need to go uh, you in any case. So you need to go outside of, of Switzerland. So you need to discover a different environment. And then, OK, you don't have so many uh, choices. So the, the US, so due to the uh, excellent education system, so the excellent universities that you have there, that was basically the, the, the choice number one. Then one, uh, why uh, Purdue? So, uh, simply because uh, in the field where I was active, so that was the number one, so worldwide. So there was not too much uh, hesitation uh, to go there. So uh, I think with uh, around um, uh, Professor Suprio Data, Professor Mark okay. Lundstrom, Professor uh, Gerard Klimek, uh, and Ashraf Alam. So you had a wonderful environment of people uh, doing uh, simulation, developing uh, new uh, simulation methods. So there was uh, almost no, no hesitation. Plus, uh, I had done an exchange when I was a PhD. I had spent six months at Purdue in 2005. So it was like uh, going back to a place that uh, I, I already knew a little bit. Okay, nice. So um, since you come from a European system of education, did you face any challenges adapting to the American system of education? I guess if I had come for a PhD, I would, but since I came as a postdoc, so it was kind of different. I did not have to take any lecture. So basically I was focusing on, on research. So it was uh, completely different. But I realized, so there were, I saw so, uh, how everything was working and I was a little bit uh, uh, surprised so how everything was organized uh, back then. Like the fact if I was looking, uh, so we were a lot of people together going from master students up to, to postdocs and even research uh, scientists. Uh, and then I was uh, looking at uh, how it worked for the master students. So they, they were there uh, attached to a group and they were spending their entire master in that group. While at ETH, it was completely different. So you were taking classes. Then you had a master thesis in the end that was just six months of, uh, of just research. So first of all, that, that was uh, different. And also at the PhD level, the fact that uh, you had to take so many courses uh -huh. in comparison to ETH, where you have to take uh, much, much less courses. And also the, the um, concept of doctoral school, which did not exist uh, back then. The fact that you do not apply to a professor to do a PhD, so you apply to that uh, doctoral school. And then from uh, that doctoral school, so there is a pre-screening. And then if you are accepted, so then you have to uh, find a professor who is uh, uh, who can accept you, who has an open position. While in our case, and it's still how we work, so if uh, I have an opening, I just open uh, that position at any time of the year and people will directly apply to me. There will be a screening from ETH after that. Uh, and maybe some people, they will have to take uh, some qualification exam. But basically, uh, the system is that uh, we decide who uh, who we want uh, to, to work with. Nice. That's, uh, that's the main difference and that uh, I, I had, um, so I would say, so I, I'm not uh, saying that one system is, is better than the other, so not at all. <laughs> They are different and seeing so how things was organized. So at the beginning, so how I had trouble understanding uh, the, when I talked to people because nobody explained that to me. So then I, I did not understand <laughs> so what we were talking about at the beginning. But then I realized, oh, it's simply a Can system is, uh, that is different. But I think now uh, some of some departments uh, at ETH, they also work on that um, system of, of doctoral school or they try mm -hmm. to introduce that. So things are, are gradually changing. OK. Mm. So you mentioned uh, some challenges when you moved to the US. So did you have any other culture shocks or any issues adapting to the workplace in the US as compared to being used to the European system? No, I, I, don't, um, I don't think so. So what I realized when I arrived is that uh, so people, they were at, at least at first at, um, at first sight, they were much more friendly than they are in, in Europe. Oh. I mean, you're even uh, in okay. the US, you don't know anybody. So the person will start talking, talking. Uh, uh -huh. to maybe, it's, maybe it's small talking, but it's still uh, something that uh, it's more difficult to get uh, to get into uh, in um, in Europe. Then, of course, so sometimes the people, they just talk and that's just an, an habit that they, they have for them. Uh -huh. I guess it was not a cultural shock. It was just a, a different okay. uh, way. So everybody is different. Every col uh, col uh, pe a country has its own culture. And that's uh -huh. what makes it really, um, really uh, beautiful. And I, I said, I would say okay. it's probably more difficult 
for somebody who is used to the system in the US to come to the uh, to Europe than vice versa. Okay. Like uh, when we had that short discussion yesterday, so you mentioned like uh, shops closing at 5 p.m. Uh, in Switzerland. Yeah, exactly. It's still something mm -hmm. that happens. Uh, and um, to, to give you an example, so one day I was sitting uh, in a terrace, so that was before COVID, of course, uh, in yeah, a terrace. Uh, in Switzerland or in the US? In, in Switzerland now. Okay. And it was before, um, it was uh, just at 5, uh, 5 p.m. on a Saturday um, uh, Saturday evening, and it closes at 5 p.m. on Saturday. On the other days of the week, it's different. Yeah. And the shop was already, it was mm -hmm. close to the entrance of the shop, and people, they keep kept coming, they looked at the door and then they left because they were surprised to see that it was closed. Like if you go exactly. to the US, you don't have that problem at all. So things might be open 24 hours a day. So then uh, you can go shopping pretty much uh, whenever uh, you um, you want. Well, so then I, I would say that's the, the main difference. Maybe one thing that um, uh, for me was kind of unusual is the fact that uh, it's difficult to survive without a car in the US. So oh, while uh, that's, yes, in, that's that's definitely true. <laughs> yeah. So that was, I would say, the mini cultural uh, shock that that, that happened. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, you left US in 2011, right? Did you ever visit US again after that? Oh yeah. So probably <laughs> I come probably four times a year or something okay. like that. So. Okay. No, no. So I, I keep coming because you have a lot of conferences uh, uh -huh. that uh, that happen in the US. So I, I kept coming. So since then, probably I have come uh, thirty more than thirty times uh, in, the, <laughs> in the US, but a little bit less uh, since two thousand uh, since uh, the beginning of two thousand and twenty. But then, yeah. yes, so it was yeah. always between. Uh, I guess the minimum that was probably two times and the maximum that was five, uh, five or six times, which is not good That's, for yeah. the climate. I know, but. <laughs> That, yeah, that is a lot of traveling. Um, so do you miss anything about the US while you are away? No, no. So I think uh, so. You always go for a short period of time. So it's not. Uh, so it just when I so um, yeah, finally. So you go to, uh, always to pretty much to the same uh, to the same places. So you go on the west coast, you go on the east coast, and from time to time you go uh, go somewhere uh -huh. in, uh, in in the middle. So when you go to the US, and if uh, you have been to a place so many times, so you have like your small habits when you you come there, and uh, uh -huh. you always feel oh it's uh, good to be to be back and to have the occasion to go to that place like you know that you uh, you eat very well in that restaurant so you can uh -huh. go there another time you can try out uh, another restaurant or you can uh, take a walk uh, through the city or you can uh -huh. go to the to the beach so i i really i really like that and i also like going to new to new places but most of the time it depends on whether there is a a conference a meaningful and a relevant okay. conference in that place okay mm, i see mm. So um, does it ever frustrate you, the traveling back and forth, the jet lag, um, all the paperwork that is involved in intercontinental travel? I guess uh, at the beginning, yes, but now uh, okay. I, got, uh, I got used to that in the sense that uh, I know what I should do to avoid uh, jet lag, for example. OK, I cannot 100 uh, percent avoid uh, avoid that but i can um i, I know pretty much so uh, when i should go to to sleep and when i should wake up to uh, to to be to feel uh, well so that means it's no more a big uh, a big trouble uh, anymore but you know, you know so it's what i travel as compared to uh, to some business uh, people so it's basically uh, nothing like uh, i remember one day i was landing i think in in san francisco coming uh, coming from zurich uh, and uh, I heard, so it was the time we were uh, getting out of the plane and I heard the lady who, who was just uh, uh, two rows in front of me and she was explaining to one of her friends that she met in the plane, oh, it's, it's the sixth times that I come to San Francisco. And I thought in me and I said, yeah, but uh, me, it's probably the ninth times that I come. And then she <laughs> said, since last January. <laughs> And we were in June, and then I realized, okay, she must travel at least once a month to San Francisco. So then she, we're not traveling wow. at the same scale. So there, I guess it's <laughs> becoming difficult um, for you. But if you travel like a once a month, but not to the US, also within Europe, and or where you can also use the train. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not a big deal. Okay. Mm, okay. Mm. So I see a very invested in academia and um, your group and your research. Did you ever think of pursuing a job in the industry? 
Oh yes, at, at uh, several uh, at several occasions. So I mean, you you have to always uh, have a plan B. So when uh, when you do something mm -hmm. like uh, when um, when I left um, or when I decided that I, I wanted to go back uh, to to Europe and also to leave uh, the US. So pretty much it was the end of my my journey uh, at at Purdue. So. I was not sure uh, to get uh, a position uh, back in Switzerland, so I knew that I would leave uh, Purdue in June. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. when I, I decided that already uh, in the fall, uh, in the fall season, but I had no confirmation that I would get uh, the position at uh, at ETH. So that I knew around uh, February or, or March. So there was a, a time period where I did not really know. So then I, I considered going okay. to industry at um, at that point. And uh, I even applied to, to a position at Synopsys in Zurich. So Synopsys, they are developing uh, uh, like uh, simulators that you can use uh, to, to model uh, nanoscale devices. So that's pretty much uh, in the area where, where I'm active. And uh, I said, OK, so then that would be uh, if it doesn't work with uh, academia. So then uh, I will uh, I will go I will go there. Uh, and then uh, finally, okay. uh, before I even re uh, received a reply from Synopsys, whether they uh, I could I was uh, invited for an interview or not. So in the meantime, I got the confirmation that I could start at um, at ETH. Uh -huh. But there was okay. uh, so it was not um, a tenure track uh, assistant professorship. It was a non tenure track uh, assistant mm -hmm. professorship. So that is something that is still exists uh, at ETH, where you are hired for a certain uh, period. And after that, so uh, maybe uh, that can uh, you, your position uh, can become a tenure track position, or maybe uh, you can apply to another position uh, that is open in the department, or uh, maybe you have to leave, so they don't have to review your case uh, in the end. So the, uh, the two first years, so you don't really think about that, but I guess starting from the third year, you start uh, having uh, some uh, to make up your mind, so what you would like uh, to do if that uh, doesn't work out. And my plan would have been to go back to industry at that time. Okay, okay, okay. Um, since you're involved in a lot of simulations and theoretical research, um, how do you feel about theoretical research versus experimental research? Do you feel one could be more important than the other? No, that's certainly not. So I think they nicely mm -hmm. complement uh, each other. So I mean, that's probably the, the answer that everybody would uh, would expect. But I think uh, <laughs> they do, they do not. Uh, they uh, one needs the other to to exist. Uh, like uh, so, if you just had theory, so you could make very nice theory. You could predict a lot of beautiful things. But as long as you have not verified them experimentally, so basically nothing is going to happen. So that is uh, clear. On the other side, so if you have uh, only experiments, especially now, so when you are at uh, very small dimensions, so you might have to do a lot of trial and error, and you keep uh, you have a huge design space to uh, to explore. It's going to take you a lot of time to to converge towards uh, an optimal uh, solution, and that's where theory can can help. So it can guide. The, the experiments and then through that uh, guide, uh, guidance so then you can more rapidly obtain so what you what you desire mm -hmm. so that's why uh, i think um, they, they nicely complement each other but of course sometimes you have people who predict something uh, theoretically that's wonderful and then it's uh, it's verified uh, experimentally and that's uh, that's really mm -hmm. something that is uh, uh, wonderful or you have the the opposite so uh, sometimes people when they try to fabricate something they obtain something uh -huh. else that was unexpected and then theory come into play and explain mm -hmm. so why uh, things behave like that so that's um, i think uh, the, the, the two pillars that you have and even people consider that a simulation a computer based simulation that would be the third uh, pillar uh, but i guess it also belongs uh, uh, to, to theory although you can say that theory just formulating the problem and then the computer you can solve them on on computers so like uh, uh, people like um, uh, back uh, like uh, einstein or ev everybody who develops the quantum mechanical framework they were theoreticians uh -huh. but they did not need any computer to do uh, to mm -hmm. do that so they really were, they were working uh, with a pen and uh, they were just working uh, with some sheets and they were writing their uh, models on the sheets. And that's what people would consider a theory. Uh, but we can also say that now uh, having taking the same equations and expanding them and solving them on a large uh, computer or, or on a small computer, that's also theory. So I would probably put simulation inside the theoretical uh, pillar. Mm, OK. Mm. So um, you mentioned 
how things need to be done iteratively and uh, you learn from your failures and you learn from your mistakes so do you think projects ever go according to the plan <laughs> sometimes they do but <laughs> but i would say it's uh, uh, it's not always um it's much much uh, it's rather seldom that it goes exactly according uh -huh. to the plan because uh, unless you have already done the work and you submit the project after you have done the work. Because when you submit a, a project, so you have an, an idea in mind, there is something, a goal that you would like to achieve. And of course, you describe all the steps that are going to bring you to that goal. But most of the time, so you have uh, something that is uh, unexpected that occurs, and then that's going to uh, push you in another direction, or that is going to require more time to um, to do, or you're going to end up finding something also that uh, uh, that is really cool and that was not part of the project but you think uh, now that you have the resources you should go in that direction so that's why i think um, it's uh, it doesn't really go according to that uh, plan but that's i would say some types of project like uh, we have what is called the swiss national science foundation which is like the um, NSF uh, in the US, mm -hmm. where they allow more fundamental research and where it's fine to have uh, projects like that because you don't really have deliverables. While on the other mm -hmm. side, you have what is called European project, where when you uh, write the project, you have to deliver something very specific at a certain time. So in that mm -hmm. case, so you're pretty much obliged to, uh, to continue and to follow the plan because you promised to have a deliverable. So that could be, uh, for example, a demonstrator, that could be a report, uh, or that can be uh, like a video that you're going to you're gonna show to explain uh, so your results. And you don't have the choice. So you committed to deliver that, and then you have to do that. So in those projects, I guess, it goes more along, uh, along the plan, while in other projects, uh, like the one that I mentioned before, so you have much more freedom, and then you can go around and you can, uh, you can find, uh, you can find a way, or you can find a way to build uh, the solution. Mm. How, how do you think then you deal with failures, or how do you keep yourself motivated and your passion alive when things don't go according to plan? <laughs> But I mean, yeah, so you, you're ready for that. And as I said, so it's not necessarily a frustration that yeah. it doesn't work according to the plan. It could be also be an excitement in the sense that uh, you did not think about something and suddenly uh, you, you see something that was unexpected, as I said before, but uh, unexpected in the good uh, sense of the yeah. word. That is uh, uh, something really uh, uh, exciting uh, for, for you. And then you want to go a little bit uh, along that uh, direction. But then uh, we know how science works. So if 100% uh, yeah. of the tries would be successful, uh, so yeah. then uh, who, who knows where we would be now? So uh, science, it's always uh, setting a problem, trying to solve it. And when it, uh, it fails, you have to start uh, start again. And that's also having the, so to, pres uh, to persist in that direction till you finally uh, manage to, to get something. So that's, uh, that's how it works. So like, uh, I remember so when I was a PhD or a postdoc. So sometimes uh, uh, I wanted to implement something. So every every evening I was thinking about that. So before going to sleep, about how I could do that. So then the next day I would go to work. I would implement that. It would fail, <laughs> and then for the rest of the day I would just start again the same process. So thinking <laughs> about how uh, another way of of uh, thinking that, doing that yeah. again late in the evening. The next day I would go to uh, to the work. And it would continue like that. It was like the movie, an endless day. So if you, if you want, so every day it was the same. That was starting. It was always ending with a failure. But I guess after maybe one day, one week or two weeks, uh, or, or I don't remember exactly. So I finally uh, got it. And then you're so happy when you you finally uh -huh. get, get what you were looking for. That uh, I mean, uh, in the end, it's uh, it's the reward is uh, equivalent to the, the pain or the difficulties that you had to get to the results. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if now I said I have a problem and tomorrow I have the solution, so I guess it's not such an interesting problem. I prefer that you have to think about um, that, you have to spend a lot of time, you have to try mm -hmm. many times uh, maybe to make some compromise. So maybe uh, so you you wanted to do something uh, like if I take a model as, a, as an example, so you wanted to have a lot of complexity and maybe you need to give up a little bit of the complexity. But in mm -hmm. the end, what matters is that you can get uh, the results that you, uh, that you wanted and that uh, 
that, as I said, so the more difficult it, it is, the more rewarding the process is. So failing is, is, not, a, is not an issue, it's just a step towards the, the success, so if you want. Mm -hmm. I can completely relate to your story, the way you said, uh, like an endless movie playing on loop, failing and failing, failing multiple times and then learning from them, because none of my processes are working according to my plan. So yeah, thank mm -hmm. you for the motivation there. If you had to pick, what would you say is the biggest mistake you made as a researcher? I so again, so I, I thought about that. So I think I made a lot of uh, of mistakes, but I don't think that I made one big mistake that uh, uh -huh. changed that change everything. Like uh, I know, so when I started at uh, at Purdue, so we had access to to a new supercomputer that was in, in Texas, uh, and okay. then uh, so we had a certain budget to do uh, to do ours, and I wanted to model some uh, some uh, surface roughness in those uh, nanowires, and then it turns out that it was computationally quite extensive because you have to simulate multiple samples all with a different uh, roughness. Uh, type such that in the end you can uh, make some statistics and then uh, so we were a little bit uh, running so we did not have en enough time and since this was the beginning of the machine so they just offered us like that so one million hours the, to run on that uh, machine and okay. then i guess in uh, two weeks or something like that i completely burned the one million hours and in the end i looked at the results and they was they were useless because i just had the hours i simulated 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 with without really thinking about uh, the results analyzing them wh while they were produced i just did everything and in the end mm -hmm. so i guess uh, i burned so many hours and i was feeling bad uh, about that mm -hmm. but then at least so what i learned uh, from from there is it's nice yeah. to have access to supercomputers it's nice uh, also to uh, to be able to run uh, large simulations a lot of time mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them but don't just burn hours because you you have those hours so you need to have a okay. goal. Uh, you really need to have a goal and you need at each step so to check that what you are doing makes sense not do everything in once mm -hmm. and then you realize later on that um, and that it's uh, it's useless so but as i said so it was a uh, a bad experience uh -huh. for me back then, but at least so I got uh, something uh, out of uh, out of that. Uh, okay. But it, and it's the mm -hmm. same. So now, uh, so I I have uh, maybe uh, done uh, similar things many times, and it's also mistakes. So that's that you make, but but you don't know. It's uh, when you are a, a professor or when you are in a position where you can hire people. So sometimes mm -hmm. you might regret uh, having hired a. Uh, one uh, one person, so you realize that you that you made a oh. made a mistake. So and that's also something uh, uh, that uh, that is called learning by doing. So you need to, mm -hmm. to make your experience, and then uh, next time, so you need to do uh, to do better. So it's uh, mm -hmm. like what uh, some people uh, said. So making mistakes is not uh, is not a problem. Is when you keep repeating the same uh -huh. mistake, even that's worse. Okay. You expect that the outcome will be different, mm -hmm. and it's not. So okay. it's, uh, keep making the same mistakes, so you still uh, yeah. keep getting the same uh, uh, results. So that's uh, that's I would yeah. say the the mistakes that uh, have mm. influenced. Okay. Um, so research is all about collaboration, and you mentioned uh, hiring people. So what qualities do you look for students to have in your group? Mm -hmm. So I guess so. What is the first step? That is a uh, first quality that is very important. Is that you want somebody who has experience in the in the field. So I'm mm -hmm. doing uh, a device simulation. So we have a little bit of uh, physics, a little bit of uh, uh, co uh, computational aspects, development of, of numerical algorithms or, or device simulation. So I'm rather looking for somebody who has knowledge already in one of those fields, such that we don't need to. Um, to start from scratch to, to completely educate uh, that person. So that's why what I usually like to do is uh, when we have master students coming to uh, to our group so that uh, we start at the master and we have six months to really see how that person uh, works. And then uh, if uh, if I'm happy, so I can hire that, uh, that person because I know both what uh, he or she can do uh, at the scientific level, mm -hmm. but I also know the personality, which is also very, very important. Mm -hmm. So that is also something that I learned, so that uh, you have to trust uh, also your feeling mm -hmm. about uh, people. Uh, like uh, when I started, so 
firms. Uh, I, uh, I, at least uh, at, in one or two occasions. So I hired uh, w- one person where I think he was perfectly qualified. So in terms of, of science, so that was uh, really uh, perfect. But when I was talking uh, to that person, so I already had a mixed, uh, a mixed uh, feeling. feeling. But I thought, okay, so that should not influence uh, my uh, my decision because that person was uh, was very good, and everybody is different, and, and it is really uh, nice to have diversity uh, in a in a group. But it turned out over the years that in fact, uh, so it was difficult to work with uh, with that person, and that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now, so I would say if I would feel the same situation when I'm trying to hire a person, even if that person on paper is great, and even when you talk to that person, so scientifically, that person is is great. So I guess uh, I would pass. So that's uh, okay. also something you need to, to learn. Uh, and also maybe uh, still along that line. So what I learned at the, the beginning. So. Uh, one of the first PhD students uh, that I hired, so after just a couple of months, so he decided to quit. And I, again, it's a place where I felt bad because I felt responsible. So yeah. I thought that I did something uh, really, uh, that I did something really bad. And that was because of me that uh, this person was uh, was leaving. So it turns out maybe it was a reason, maybe it was not, so that I could not uh, uh, figure out. But what I tried to do is um, I tried to, um, to keep that person, to convince that person to to stay, because I thought that it was a good thing to do, explaining that uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was the beginning of the PhD, it might be difficult, uh, and so on. But then I talked to to some people more experienced than me, mm-hmm. and what they told me is that if somebody wants to leave, so I guess mm-hmm. it's better to le- uh, let them uh, them leave. Okay, you have to talk uh, to talk to them to them to understand their their reason. But if they really want to leave, so trying to keep them, it's maybe not the best uh, the best uh, solution. But of course, I would not act the same way if it's uh, the person wants to leave after two, three, or four months, yeah. or the person after two and a half years decides that uh, uh, he or she wants to leave. So then I would really take. Still now, I would take the time and try to understand and maybe also to convince. But now, if a person wants to leave after three months, I think it's the best uh, because that person is not happy where he or she is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what would you say is more important, technical skill or a willingness to learn? I think the the ability to learn is uh, is more important, but it's much more difficult to quantify and to to measure mm. because yeah, the scientific good. skills, so the skills, so that you can uh, you can measure uh, pretty much easily. You have a discussion with the the person about technical uh, details. You ask questions, and then you see whether the person can just. Uh, uh, simply um, tell you something that uh, he or she has read, or if that that person can really explain the things uh, going deep into the the details. But now that uh, doesn't tell uh, you much. So if he or she can learn more, or if uh, that's already uh, the 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 top of um, of what he or she can do, that's that's one thing. And yeah. the, the other thing, it's the uh, the how should I say that the ability to go beyond uh, just solving problems because there are two things different. So you can be good at solving problem in the sense I give you a problem and you give me the the solution, which is nice. But doing a PhD, it's also to come up yourself with the problem uh, a little bit and then to to solve it. And that's also where uh, the the difficulty is. Uh, So at least not at the beginning, but uh, with time over the years, so it should not always come from your supervisor. So what you should solve, but by yourself. So you should uh, see. So this is important. I should go. Uh, I should go in in that direction. And uh, some people they are really excellent at solving problems, so concrete problems, but they cannot really think about the next step and what should be uh, should be done. And that's uh, I think uh, also something that uh, when you have an interview with a person, so you will not directly see whether he or she has that uh, ability. Makes sense. So you mentioned students getting frustrated and quitting the research midway. So what are some other mistakes you see a lot of young researchers making? <laughs> so one. Uh, so it's difficult uh, to say. So I, I have uh, I have seen so some people they are so enthusiastic about uh, their field. Uh, so they have sometimes uh, expectations that do not necessarily correspond uh, to reality in terms <laughs> reality, of uh, what okay. we can we can do or not. But I mean, it's 
in a sense, great to show that enthusiasm. And you don't want to slow down those people right from the beginning because that could be a little bit um, uh, depressing for them. So you want, uh, ideally, you want them to go a little bit during a couple of months and that by themselves, they understand what are the boundaries, so what can be done and what cannot uh, be done. Because if you have somebody who comes to you and say, oh, okay, I want to revolutionize the field of quantum mechanics, so that sounds great, but you have to be, uh, uh-huh. to be honest uh, in the sense that uh, you will not do that uh, you will probably not do that during a PhD. So who knows? So uh, there are some genius. So maybe some people could do that. But uh, I guess uh, they are kind of um, of uh, seldom. So that I would say. So the discrepancy between uh, uh, what can be done and and what uh, they they will do. So that that could be um, uh, a mistake that I, I have been uh, observed. And uh, yeah, so having uh, those those expectations, or having, uh, in fact, uh, expectations that do not correspond to the to the project. So like, uh, you come because you think you're going to work on something, but in fact, uh, and although the project is written, you think that you can go around the the project. So although we said before that the project they not always go according to the plan, so the goal is still to to achieve. So what? Um, the goal of the project, there might be some some details, but some people, so they would start from there and take that as an occasion to go somewhere else. And then uh, sometimes that that could lead to to some frustration. And that's uh, what we would like uh, to to avoid. Yeah, I think being a professor also automatically makes you a mentor of sorts. So if you have to give a piece of advice to grad students, what would you uh, tell them? So I guess I, I tell that uh, to all the grad students who, st- who are at the beginning of their PhD or even when, when we have an interview, I always say that, uh, so in a PhD, they are ups and they are downs. So that always happens. Like That's like a wave. So the wave goes up and then you have a dip in the wave. And you will at a, a one point go to one of those uh, dips. So I think that's the something that happens to everybody. So then you have to be really convinced by the project that you are choosing and the, the field you are going to working on, such that when you're going to be in one of those dips, when you're going to start facing challenges, so inside of you, you're going to find the force to overcome that challenge and to go up again that uh, that wave. So that's what I always uh, tell them. Uh, at least that's what I had. I saw also I had up and I had downs during my PhD. And sometimes uh, you are wondering why, why am I doing that? So where am I going? And Mm -hmm. if it's really a field that you like, so you will be able to find again the motivation. So maybe you need to take a step back. So you need to go a little bit outside to do something different um, uh, during a couple of uh, of weekends, stop thinking about uh, something else. But you will, uh, in the end, uh, find again the motivation. While if you do a PhD because you think it's nice to do a PhD, so it will be good on your CV, or uh, you have the choice between uh, different uh, different projects and you choose one because maybe you can earn a little bit of more money uh, in one project than in the other. So I think it's the wrong um, the wrong de- decision. So what should matters is really that you enjoy what you are doing. Uh, and even so, when people have uh, are interviewing in many places, so I always encourage them really to continue going to, to interviews. And then when they come back uh, to me, that it's really what they want to do. It's not that uh, they choose my group by default because uh, okay. that's okay. Mm-hmm. I went there and then I was happy with them and then I make them an offer. I prefer that uh, they go to, to somebody else. They, they talked there and then finally that uh, they choose another one. So that happens that I encourage somebody to do that. And after that, he came back to me and he said, oh, finally, I prefer the, the PhD in the other group. It's fine with me because what is important is that people are happy and that they, they love what they are doing. Okay, makes sense. Mm. As we are drawing to a close, I would like to remind the audience if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, so yes, Professor, like you mentioned, having the right expectations is very important. So um, what what would you say you love about being a professor, love about a- academia, and what, do you, what would you say you hate about this? So I think uh, what I, I like uh, really in academia, so that's the, the freedom that uh, that we have. So that means uh, today you work on a certain uh, subject that uh, you find really interesting, like, for example, uh, uh, exploring uh, two novel 2D materials. So I, I really uh, find that enjoyable or, or working on memristors, so trying to find new applications for memristors. 
But I mean, uh, in two or three years, so I can move uh, to to something else. So there, it's not a constrained field. So um, of course, I will always do uh, modeling. So probably I will not uh, now start uh, fabricating something myself. But within that field, so I have that uh, that entire freedom, and that's uh, that's what I enjoy. And also the the diversity of. Um, of the job so if you want so uh, sometimes you have to teach uh, sometimes you can write projects so it's always nice so to start setting up a project with collaborators some of them are even friends so that's uh, that's really something cool so you start from a, a white uh, page and then you go up to a, to a project and then you can really start working on on, on that uh, and also you have those uh, exchange of ideas with phd students with uh, postdocs and also with colleagues uh, where it's uh, very often by by having some informal discussion like that that you have some some great ideas that uh, that come uh, come into reality and then you can uh, start uh, implementing uh, them and in the end i would say that uh, what i'm doing is is my passion and uh, my passion is my job at the same time so that's uh, that's what is uh, is really cool now uh, of course I, I would not say that uh, everything is uh, is perfect and, and I live uh, in an ideal world but I would not say that there is something that I hate uh, in my in my job so what I don't like or what frustrates me it's still the same so you have a student he or she submits a paper and the paper gets rejected so you still so I thought that I would pass that point but you still it's not the same as before when I was writing the paper myself but you still have that uh, that uh, feeling that uh, okay the the reviewer did not understand what we were trying to uh, to show or something like that and now it's a little bit more also with the projects so sometimes you also feel that frustration when you have spend such a long time uh, preparing a project and you think that uh, everything is is clear and then you end up getting reviews where the people do not at least that's the, your impression they do not judge the content of your project but they judge uh, something something else uh, something else or they just hold on to one small detail that uh, is not relevant to the entire project and still they insist uh, on that so i would say that's what i i like uh, uh, I like a little bit less, but it's uh, so much compensated by the rest that in mm -hmm. the end is uh, almost insignificant. Okay. Mm. We have a question from the audience along similar lines. Um, so um, how do you balance out these things, your experiences, your frustrations, your planning and your goals? <laughs> So I guess uh, what is important is always to have uh, something else. So your life, uh, uh, so my life should not be my my job so i try to okay. uh, to avoid that so to have also uh, other things uh, that um, that you like so like uh, in the winter so not this year but usually i like uh, skiing i like uh, mountain biking uh, i like hiking and each time when i go outside uh, so then i can uh, think about uh, different things so i can really enjoy the moment and i can completely make a void with uh, with my work or if I want so also I can uh, use that occasion to think about something uh, specific so if, if that's uh, what I want but I like to be able to cut uh, uh, to cut um, the, the life at work from uh, from the rest and having those um, kind of uh, time slots where I can do different things mm -hmm. and the other things that I have done uh, for so many times is uh, I work in Zurich during the week but then during the weekend, I go back to the French part of Switzerland. So since it's a small country, so you can easily do that. And that's how I make the cut. So then I have, in a sense, uh, not two different lives. So it's still the same life, but it's easier to be disconnected uh, from, from the work. So I guess uh, yeah. while if you look, you walk, uh, you live too close to your, to your office and it's Saturday and it's raining, so you don't know what to do. So uh, you're going to go to your, to your office. Well, uh, okay, in, in my case, so if it's Saturday, it's raining, so maybe I'm going to open my, my computer, so that's true, but I could still go out, I could still uh, take a walk, I could still call a friend and, and do something, so that's uh, that's a way of uh, having a different, um, mm -hmm. uh, different things in life. Okay. And coming from Switzerland, did you have uh, a very easy time adjusting to the winters in India, no? <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah. In fact, yes. So, and, and uh, that's kind of a funny, maybe funny anecdote. So, uh, the first time I, I came to to Indiana, so that was in uh, July two thousand and five. Mm -hmm. So, okay, for uh, to stay. So, I had been once there before, and uh, people kept telling me, uh, "You're going to see the winter here. They are extremely cold." 
And I was <laughs> thinking in myself, look, guys, I come from the Swiss Alps. So don't <laughs> tell me what the winter is, so I know what the winter is. So that was my belief. But then when December came and mm -hmm. I saw how cold <laughs> and dry the air was, uh, dry and so on, sometimes, so, so at least the feeling was so cold, then I, I, <laughs> I completely changed my mind. I said, yeah, the winter in Switzerland, they are really mild as compared to Indiana. <laughs> so, oh. Okay, interesting. Mm, we have another question from the audience. Um, do you think diversity within the group brings conflict? No, I don't. I don't think so. I have never seen, uh, at least in my group, but maybe I don't have uh, probably as much diversity as uh, uh, in the US because we don't get uh, as many uh, applications maybe uh, from uh, f uh, from outside of Europe. So we have. Uh, probably 80 percent at or 70 percent from Europe, but the part no, the non-European part is is growing. But that that has never led to any conflict uh, in my group. Of course, sometimes you can have people that uh, get on well or don't get uh, that well uh, with each other. But that was never related to the uh, to the diversity in the group. That was simply that uh, we are all human being and uh, we all have uh, people. Uh, that we like better than than the others. So even if we don't, uh, so as a professor, I cannot do that. I have to treat everybody equally. But I mean, in real life, so I always have. So if I have a meeting with uh, 20 people that I know, I will uh, most of the time stay with the same people with whom I have more affinity than uh, than the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Since there are no more questions from the audience, let me close with this. Um, what do you want? What your legacy as a researcher to be? <laughs> so I guess uh, I would be very happy if I have one legacy, <laughs> but uh, so I would say I'm still a, a little bit uh, so <laughs> to to. Um, um, not directly answer your question. I would say I'm still a little bit too uh, too young to start thinking mm -hmm. about my legacy. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I still have probably 25 uh, more years before I uh, before I retire. But I guess uh, so. My field of activity is in device uh, simulation. So mm -hmm. if I could uh, left, uh, if I could leave uh, something in that field that is going to last beyond uh, my my career at uh, ETH, I think I would be very happy with that. Yeah. That's, yeah, we all would like that um, to leave behind something that other people could use. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the yeah. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of this interview. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for talking to us. Mm -hmm. oh, it was my pleasure. I can still see you are very. You have very fond memories of Purdue, and uh, you clearly like your time here. Yeah, so I really, I really like that. So I really like because. Um, in fact, I was just there to do research and I could do a lot of research in an environment that was really uh, uh, wonderful uh, for that. So, no, I, I was uh, very happy with, uh, with the time that I, I spent there. So I spent three and a half uh, years. The only thing maybe is so what I would have done differently. I think um, after three years, I think I had seen everything uh, that I had to, to see there. Maybe I should have... Um, I should have left uh, six months uh, earlier. That's the only okay. regret. But then if you look six months in a life, so that's basically nothing. So <laughs> that's why. Yeah, that, yeah, when you're talking about leaving a legacy behind, six months is next to nothing. Exactly. So no, no. So that's why. So I keep uh, essentially uh, very good memories from my, from my time there. Yeah, we are very glad to hear that. Mm, so it must be getting late there. So um, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, and have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the interview and uh, maybe see you one day in the future at the conference or, or somewhere else. Yes. Thank okay. you, Professor. Yeah, bye-bye.